Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Uh, please take your seats if you have the opportunity. There should be plenty to find. Uh, and, uh, but thank you so much for coming this afternoon. This is the ASA APSF Ellison C. Pierce Lecture. It's going to be a given day by Dr. Jeff Cooper. It's called Respectful, Trusting Relationships Are Essential for Patient Safety, Especially the Surgeon Anesthesiologist Dyad. So this is an honor of Dr. Ellison C. Pierce, Jr., who was ASA president in 1984-85, and in honor of his vision and unwavering commitment to patient safety. It was Dr. Pierce working with today's speaker, Dr. Jeff Cooper, that really started APSF. And we're very proud of what that's become. Matter of fact, our speaker today, Dr. Cooper, actually coined the term Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. So it's a perfect fitting uh, tribute to Dr. Pierce that Dr. Cooper would be making this speech today. Uh, so Dr. Pierce was the past president in 1984, founding president of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. And one of the past, in this past century, one of the most influential patient safety advocates he and Dr. Cooper both have been named one of the 100 most influential individuals in medicine in the United States in the past century. There you go. I'm now going to invite Dr. Maria Van Pelt and Dr. Rich Ehrman up to the stage. We have just a couple quick awards to give, and I'll come back up and we'll finish our introduction of Dr. Cooper. Good afternoon, everyone. It's our pleasure to introduce to you the winners of the Ellison Pierce Patient Safety Award. On behalf of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, we would like to thank the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation Committee on Education and Training, the ASA Subcommittee on Patient Safety and Practice Management. We'd like to also thank Dr. Rich Ehrman for chairing that subcommittee and for all of the work that they did over the past year to select the winners. So that you are aware, the subcommittee reviewed over 90 abstracts. After rigorous selection, they selected 18 abstracts, which moved forward to the subcommittee for the Committee on Education and Training, and two were selected as the winners. So it's our pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Tim, I'm sorry, not, <laughs> Tim Castora and his colleagues, who are the first place winners for best practice advisories, increased transfusion guideline compliance, reduced blood utilization, and save costs. Congratulations. Perfect. Okay. Second place winners, Dr. Anna Buddy. And in her absence, we are going to have Dr. Stephen Estimi come in and accept the award on her behalf. Thank you. Yep.
Okay. It's on to me. I didn't introduce myself. I'm uh, Dr. Mark Warner. I'm the president of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. Uh, I'm going to be unabashedly and uh, brazenly supportive of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation here for you. If you get a chance on your way out and Dr. Cooper gives a great talk and you love him to death, feel free to go up to the little table out back. We've got a place you dip your credit card in and we can charge the health cap in. No, no. <laughs> you can put in how much you'd like to donate on behalf of Dr. Cooper and it all goes to APSF and all the great things that organization does. It's now my honor to introduce Dr. Jeff Cooper. Uh, he's also, like Dr. Pierce, a remarkable pioneer in anesthesia patient safety. I know my very first day in anesthesia an article came out in Anesthesiology by Dr. Cooper that really set the whole idea of critical incidents reporting being important in patient safety. And, and that was my first introduction to anesthesia, which makes it even better 41 years later to be able to introduce Dr. Cooper. He started this use of critical incidents analysis and other scientific approaches in anesthesia patient safety. He and Dr. Pierce were the driving founders of APSF, and as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Cooper even suggested the name Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. Incredibly fitting that he would give this talk today. He's had multiple awards and recognitions. I won't go through them all, but he's the only non-physician to ever receive the ASA's Distinguished Service Award. That's the highest honor given by this society to an individual annually. He also is the Eisenberg Award winner for Lifetime Achievement in Patient Safety from the Joint Commission. So this is an ordinary person. Jeff is an incredible patient safety advocate and uh, really a uh, hero. Like Dr. Paris, he is one of the 20th century's most influential patient safety advocates. Jeff, would you please come up? Thank you. So Jeff's going to talk about the respectful, trusting relationships they're essential for patient safety. Jeff, thank you, man. Thanks for that uh, warm, if slightly exaggerated, introduction, Mark. Uh, greatly appreciated. And thanks to all of you for coming today uh, to honor G. Pierce, and perhaps also because you're intrigued by this topic. Before I get into the topic, I'd like to say you know, I find myself here and often in my professional life wondering how it is I got here. How did I get so lucky? In particular, in um, 1972, to, uh, yes, that is me, uh, to land at the Massachusetts General Hospital in the Department of Anesthesia, now Anesthesia Critical Care and Pain Medicine, and in the Anesthesia Bioengineering Group with some wonderful, wonderful colleagues. Of course, a lot of things have changed since then. The, Ties are narrower, uh, and I like to say for all those people who are 26 years old, like I was then, uh, if you think it's interesting and funny how much people change, look in the mirror and imagine your own evolution. Uh, but I was just really fortunate to land with this group of diverse professionals who were incredibly generous. They weren't just smart and savvy and passionate about doing good things, but they were incredibly generative and collegial, and they were my mentors, and it was because of them that all of this happened, and the things that I've been able to help contribute to anesthesia came about because of that mentoring and that help and that diversity. And that diversity came about because of the enabling environment that was created by Richard J. Kitts, who uh, passed away a few years ago, my former chair, and in later years, my good friend. And Dick was a great leader and a great chair. And one of the things he did was create this environment for creativity that he appreciated that having diverse group of professionals in the department, and this is you know starting way, way back over, it's like 45 years ago, especially engineers to be working closely with anesthesiologists to develop the next generation of all kinds of things. And having somebody that was so enabling and inspiring and supportive was critical to me, even though I generally felt well accepted and it was great to be in that environment that allowed us to thrive. There were times that people weren't so happy about these engineers running around, sometimes them thinking that, what are you guys telling us what to do? And it was because Dick was so supportive and could provide the cover 
that we were able to do the things that we, that we did. But another thing I'm so grateful for and find myself lucky about is that I landed in the community of anesthesiologists, a, a generative, caring, thoughtful community of people wanting to do the right thing. And I'm going to be talking about some of the history of how we got to do all that, but I really thank all of you for making all of that possible. And it's that kind of thoughtfulness and caring, and especially the environment that I lived in, that allowed us to publish, to do the studies that led to the critical incident studies that were published in, in the first in 1978, and in which we, for those of you, just to remind you, talked to a large group of anesthesiologists and residents and CRNAs over several years and collected from them stories about the mistakes they had made or observed and that this became the beginning of what led to what we now call patient safety and certainly a career for me. So what I, I, I want to do is uh, talk to you about to learn from the past about strategies and tactics that led to sa safer anesthesia. So I want to do a little bit of my version of the history of patient safety, and that's to lead up to the main topic, which is to reflect and improve upon your relationships with your perioperative colleagues, and in particular, surgeons. But what I'll be talking about applies to everybody in the operating room, but I'm going to concentrate on that, what we call dyad. And before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about Jeep, and also mention that unfortunately I have no disclosures. Uh, I'd like to say a few words to add what Mark has said about Jeep. He really was an incredible guy. Uh, for those who knew him, you knew how passionate he was about patient safety, how much he cared about it, but he was a great leader for many reasons, in particular because at this time when there was this malpractice crisis and people wanted to fight the lawyers, and if you will, the patients, so that there wouldn't be these payouts for adverse events, Jeep had the courage to stand up during his year as president in 1984 and establish a patient safety and risk management committee and advocate to prevent the adverse events rather than try to stop the payouts in a legal way. And that was a courageous thing to do. He also was an incredible, incredible diplomat. He knew when to push, and he knew when not to push. And another thing about him was he just made us all feel great. When you were around Jeep, you just felt so important. I always did. He would just always say these nice, encouraging things. And when Jeep asked you to do something, you did it because you wanted to do it for Jeep. So there's so many qualities that leaders can emulate about Jeep. And we really have been fortunate in APSF because Bob Stolting came along and was president for 19 years. And now Mark Warner, who's just doing an incredible job in taking APSF forward. So again, we've been lucky to have these leaders who have so many wonderful qualities that all of us can emulate and learn from. Now, Jeep had another side, a couple other sides. He's human like the rest of us. Uh, I didn't work in an operating room with him, but uh, I wouldn't want to be on the other side of that phone call with Jeep when he was running the operating room. But he also knew how to play. He was a playful guy. I didn't have a great resolution picture of this, but he had a great laugh. And in the APSF executive committee in those years, uh, Rick Syker and, and um, Casey Blitt were real jokesters. And boy, we really had a lot of fun. And Jeep really could keep it light, even when things were really serious. So he's a wonderful guy, uh, was a wonderful guy. We really all miss him. And he just did so much for all of us. So I wanted to mention a few things. Again, I'll talk a little bit now about the journey of patient safety, anesthesia patient safety, and then lead that into the main topic. Uh, but the question of how this all came to be, Dick Kitts earns a, a, a really important uh, thank you for this. I think there's a hidden story that people don't know about. After we had done, we were doing this work in critical incidents, Dick really, really caught on for Dick. He didn't start out as a patient safety advocate, but he got it. He understood that the study of errors and the human factors was really important. And in around 1982 or so, I'm not surely, exactly sure when, he was invited to become inducted into the Royal College of Anesthetists in England. And he said, well, I've got to give a talk. Could you give me your slides so I can talk about the work that you're doing? I gave him the slides, and I coached him. He gave the talk. And in the, I think his host and in the audience was Sir Cecil Gray, who was an eminent British anesthetist. And after Dick gave the talk, Sir Cecil, I assume it is, uh, said, well, you ought to organize a conference, an international conference about 
uh, anesthesia, mortality, and morbidity. And, and that's what we did. Uh, and this is where APSF actually came from. We organized this conference in Boston, the International Symposium for actually on preventable anesthesia, mortality, and morbidity. We invited about 50 people there, including anesthesiologists from around the world and other people like lawyers and representatives from industry. Uh, that's a Jeep up at the top and Dick in the other circle and then I'm over on the, uh, on the other side. And it was at this conference that Jeep first talked about, raised the idea of an Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. I think he'd thought about it before, but it was at this meeting that he publicly talked about it. And after the meeting, he and Dick and I and a few others, including John Eichhorn, sat around in a room and plotted out how to create this foundation. And at some point, as it was mentioned, we had, well, they, Jeep said, well, what do we call it? And I just have a very simple mind, if you will. I said, well, it's a foundation, right? It's about anesthesia patient safety, right? So just call it the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. Now, if I really had vision, I would have called it the Perioperative Patient Safety Foundation, but we didn't really think about that till many years later. So what I'd like to talk to you about first is the strategy and tactics that APSF used all these years to develop patient safety. Now, we never had one of those strategy meetings that I remember in those first a few decades, if you will. We never sat for a day and a half with a facilitator and had some book of strategies. But in retrospect, there was a strategy and there were tactics. I want to describe what they were because the same kinds of strategies and tactics apply today to keep it, to maintain and keep advancing patient safety. So think of patient safety as a big rock. You're trying to move up a steep hill and there's a little guy there who's trying to hold that rock or push it up. And that's what most of it was like for decades before. The individual being vigilant was mostly what patient safety it was about. Yes, some organizations were doing things and things were happening. It wasn't like there was nothing. But most of it was the, really on the individual to make a difference by him or herself. So if you want to move a big object of a steep hill, you need a lever. And you need a fulcrum. Now, the fulcrum was based on, built on several different concepts. One being research, like the critical incident studies, and money, because there was a huge incentive from the malpractice crisis that was costing everybody in anesthesia a pretty substantial sum to pay for malpractice premiums. That's part of the fulcrum. And then there was this story uh, called Deep Sleep that was played on, 20, on ABC 2020 in around, I think, 1982, 83 or so. And this show galvanized the public, the people, most there were only a few network channels back then. So a lot of people saw this show. And it, it, it talked about, I think there were three different families in which there had been catastrophic adverse events from anesthesia. So this became a, another, a, another part of the fulcrum on which to use the lever. Then to put the, the weight to the lever to start to move the rock, the most critical weight at first was the APSF newsletter. John Eichhorn was a fabulous first editor of this. As you know, all of you who read it, which I'm sure all in this audience do, it's thoughtfully written. It's about critical topics that are relevant in your day-to-day -day anesthesia lives. Uh, and it's, a, it's regular, it's easy to read. This, I think, giving out this message, uh, and especially giving it out for free, was absolutely critical. Now, early on, right at the beginning, we said, should we charge a subscription for it? We realized, no, we don't want to do that because the people who most need it won't pay. So the biggest thing we did at first was to give this out for free and send it to everybody that was on the, a list that we could get. And again, I don't think there were email lists back then. This was before email. But we had the list from the ASA, and that's how it all started. Another big weight on the lever was research, that we started the research grants program that was been going on all of these years and given out many millions of dollars to develop this. This was the first patient safety directed grants, not just in anesthesia, but really anywhere. And we only gave out $35,000 grants in those first years. It wasn't just the research that was done, but this was money that allowed young investigators to get started in patient safety and build their careers around it and become the leaders in patient safety. We were frugal, an all volunteer organization, and it's still a cheap organization, if you will. Uh, and it's still frugal, 
Back then, everybody was a volunteer. Over the years, there have been some stipends, but still meager amounts compared to the effort and the energy that are put in by the people involved in APSF. And we kept giving out this relentless message, because that's what you have to do for safety. You can never stop. You have to keep talking about it. And I should mention, by the way, about the newsletter and that message that continues, Bob Morell did an incredible job taking over from John Eichhorn and Steve Greenberg now, following on from, um, uh, from Bob. Uh, again, we we're just so fortunate to have these committed, dedicated, really savvy people in continuing to put out this message. But then we had initiatives, one after the other, like fire safety and medication safety, the beach chair position, you know, big topics, little topics, one on the other to keep adding weight to the lever. Uh, maybe the rock moved a little, but we still, so many other things were done, again, not just by APSF, but standards, practice guidelines, airway management tools, safer drugs, simulation and crisis management, technologies like pulse oximetry and capnometry, all these things adding weight to move the rock. But the most important thing was all of you in this audience and all of the people over these past decades who are working day to day in anesthesia who got this idea, got really understood how important all this was, adopted these initiatives and these different things that had to be done and changed the culture of anesthesia that gave safety so much prominence. And the rock moved. The rock moved. Now, again, it wasn't just APSF that did it. The ASA certainly has been a really strong supporter of these offers, has, has offer, uh, these efforts, and has many, uh, many efforts of its own and initiatives. And the AAAN2 AN2 and the Joint Commission, and to some extent the AP, NPSF and other organizations that collectively have been moving the rock of patient safety and adding to it. So, the question people have is, well, how do you know that this made a difference? Now, it's really hard to measure safety because bad events are rare, and particularly in anesthesia, it's really hard to tell to what extent does the anesthesia contribute, does the surgery com contribute, does the patient's disease contribute. But this is a study from 2012 that looked at a whole decade of anesthesia outcomes. It was a systematic review, something of a meta-analysis, but not quite. Uh, of, I think, 87 different papers involving many millions, I think about 20 million patients overall. And as you can see, things changed over the decades. Actually, good things happened. That curve is pretty steep even before the founding of APSF. But things that APSF and others did continued to push down the mortality rate. And that's hundreds of people per million of deaths contribute where anesthesia was contributory. But still, again, it's really tough to know how much it's changed. And that's what makes safety so hard. You really can't tell easily when you're making a difference. But one measure that means a lot is from uh, some data from our insurance company, the Crico RMF, that insures all of the physicians affiliated with the, ho the hospitals affiliated with Harvard Medical School. In 1987, if you accounted for inflation, the malpractice rate today would be $42.7,000 per person. Instead, in 2019, the standard rate is 10.7. And if you participate, which everybody does, in the simulation initiative, which every three years, every anesthesiologist has to do a simulation, uh, now full team simulation with the entire OR team, and in the other two years, other kinds of boosters, if you will, the rate is actually $5,000 a year for uh, Crico insured anesthesiologist. That's a huge difference. I don't know, it's not science, but the actuaries of this insurance company believe that all of this made a difference and they're charging much lower premiums than there otherwise would be. And I think it's a strong piece of evidence. So I think everybody can have an attaboy and an girl uh, for doing the good work over these decades that have made a difference and it makes a difference every day. Uh, but don't wait for too long because the rock got bigger. It gets bigger all the time. And you have to keep at it, and we have to keep doing things. And you ask, well, why is it? Why is the rock bigger? Well, why, doesn't, why can't we just you know, be happy with the way it is? And that's because something that happens in every industry, as safety advances, 
The system increases the risk by increasing production in, in the case of anesthesia by bringing in sicker patients and more challenging procedures as well as the production. So you can't stop work. You gotta keep adding weight to the lever in order to at least keep the rock where it is and even work harder to keep getting it to move up the hill. And that's why APSF has developed all of these priorities, these dozen priorities under Mark's leadership to do a Delphi study essentially and look at all the things that we have to do. I'm not going to go through these. Each one of these can be a topic of one of these lectures and each one of these may be things that various ones of you are working on. But APSF does have a strategy. Uh, I'm not on the board anymore, and uh, I don't remember being in a specific strategy meeting that led to this, but there are a lot of strategic things going on now, including using social media in a really broad way and having the ambassadors and using Facebook and Twitter and the ways especially that younger people are communicating today to get this message out. To partner with other organizations like FAIR, and in particular to create this mentoring award, this uh, uh, mentored research award to develop the patient safety leaders of the future. And also to expand the reach of APSF by hosting the collaboratives like the multi-center handoff collaborative working on the topic of handoffs and hosting, that we hosting the webpage, which you can see on the APSF site. Uh, but this extends the reach by recruiting more people to be involved in anesthesia, patient safety. And the newsletter is now in six different languages, so we're finally getting out there and reaching the rest of the world, and they're hungry for it. They really want this. And then things like the Stolting Conference that we just had uh, just uh, in Phoenix earlier in September, uh, where we use these innovative techniques. Della Lynn led that. It was a fabulous, exciting, creative uh, meeting to develop new ideas around failure to rescue. So there's a strategy, and I think the strategy and all these specific projects are going to keep moving, but it's still not enough. There's a core issue that's at the heart of safety. It's this unmentionable, the elephant in the room, that's about relationships. No matter how many technologies we have, no matter how much awareness we raise, <clears throat> Safety is not just about culture, that word culture. It's about how people work together, how you get along, how you have each other's back, how you communicate, how you collaborate. And I think there's something that's dysfunctional about that. I know that's a harsh word, but that's what it feels like to me, and that's why I'm addressing it. Now, John Bunker, who is an eminent anesthesiologist at Stanford, published this book in 1972, The Anesthesiologist and the Surgeon, Partners in the Operating Room. I found this walking down Charles Street in Boston about 30 years ago. I uh, bought it for a dollar. I was sitting in a box outside a bookstore. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a neat book. And it doesn't describe a very good partnership. I don't think that was his intent. But if you read this book, it's not about the great partnership you'd like it to be. But anesthesiologists and surgeons should be partners in the operating room, and that's what I'm advocating for. A book that's actually more appropriate for this is Divide and Conquer, written by Diana McLean Smith, who works on looking at dyads and teams, among other things. There's a follow-on book, Elephant in the Room. It's a fabulous book to try to understand how uh, one aspect of teamwork that people don't talk about much, because when we think about teamwork, we think about the whole team, about everybody gets along, but it turns out there are critical dyads in teams, and if you think about the teams that you work on, there's often two people who either make or break the team. And what Diana McLean Smith has done is analyze examples of this in the corporate world, examples like Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt that were a fabulous team, despite the fact they had very different opinions about the way the world should be, but they worked together to win World War II. And then there's the story of Steve Jobs and John Scully, who at the beginning were a great team, but their relationship totally soured and almost brought down Apple completely. And she talks about those dyads and how important that relationship is for those dyads to be successful and how when they're dysfunctional, it can bring down an entire organization. I think this applies in the operating room. And that's why I wrote this article that was published 
simultaneously in anesthesiology in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons, which I don't know if it's happened before, but it's pretty unusual. But both of the editors thought this was important enough. And, and I got to thinking about it. I think, I don't even remember the exact moment, but I think I was in a QA meeting and there was you know, some event being described. And somebody made one of those snide remarks about, oh, the surgeons. And I just kind of, it just kind of was the straw that broke the camel's back for me about hearing that once too often that kind of negative stereotype that just didn't feel good and healthy. And I hang out with surgeons too, and they don't really talk about it as much, but if you do, they have their stereotypes. But what I'd like you to be thinking about now are stereotypes. So if I say to you, if you look at this picture, and I say there is a fracture, how many people are familiar with that? Okay, well, I'm gonna play it for you. This is a shortened version. Uh, I got the software and I took the same script. I didn't change the theme of it. I just made it a little short year, short for those who haven't seen it uh, or those who have to Hi. see this. Hi. Are you the registrar of anesthesia? Yes. I need to book a case. Who are you? I am the registrar for orthopedia. Sure. What's the story? There is a fracture. I need to fix it. Tell me more. The fracture is very displaced. I need to fix it. Where is the fracture? The fracture is in the emergency department. That's not what I meant. Who does the fracture belong to? Ah, the fracture belongs to a 97-year-old lady from the nursing home. Anything else you can tell me? She is healthy except her temperature is 29 degrees, and her pH is 6.8. Really? And, she has a condition I have not seen before. Asystole. Asystole? And you want me to anesthetize her? There is a fracture. I need to fix it. Why didn't you tell me about the asystole? Because then you might refuse to anesthetize her. She is not fit for a haircut let alone an operation. It won't take me long to fix the fracture. I'm very skilled with hammers and power drills. She has other management priorities at the moment. Like the fracture? Like CPR. They have finished doing that. They have stopped doing CPR on someone in asystole. Yes. That means she is dead. There will be minimal blood loss. You're right. There is not much blood loss when there is no friggin' cardiac output. You are being obstructive by refusing to do my case. You are making my head hurt. There is a fracture. I need to fix it. I need to punch a brick wall. If you break your hand, I will fix it for you. So, uh, yeah, you can't help but laugh at this. And uh, I actually saw this for the first time the only time I presented anything about that paper was to a group of general surgeons at Mass General, and it was a surgeon who invited me to do it, and she showed me that video, and she showed it to that audience. And I said, you want to show this to this group? But that's where I had seen it. And, and it's funny, and frankly, I don't think they laugh too much. Uh, and that's my point. Um, there's something really insulting about this. If, to me, if I were a surgeon, I, I, I wouldn't think this is so funny. And yet, stereotypes have some reality to them. But I want you to think about what would happen if a surgeon wrote a script like that. Let's see, get this to go. Ah. There we go. So uh, this one's not on YouTube. I don't plan to put it on YouTube. Uh, but a, somebody wrote to me after I published the paper and said he was interested in collaborating. He'd been a vascular surgeon for 18 years, is now an anesthesiologist. Uh, so I said, oh, could you draft a script? And this is what we came up with. Are you the registrar of vascularia? Yes. You've booked a case. Who are you? I am the registrar of anesthesia. What's the story? You've booked a case. I need to cancel it. Can you tell me why? The patient is very high risk. Where is the risk? The risk is in the pre-op holding area. That's not what I meant. Who does the risk belong to? Ah, uh, the risk belongs to a 72-year-old man from a nursing home and he has an ischemic limb. Anything else you can tell me? He is not fasted. This is not elective and he has no cardiac history. His blood glucose is 139. We don't have an A1C, cholesterol, or triglycerides and he hasn't had a cardiac cath in at least three months. His left foot is blue, cold, and insensate. He will lose his leg if we delay. I was going to look at his leg, but it was time for my coffee break. And reperfusing that leg might do bad things to his heart. This is a limb-threatening emergency. I doubt he can exercise to even four meds, 
so we require an exercise stress test. You're right, you can't walk very fast on a freaking dead leg. And I think I'd like to see PFTs to assess his respiratory reserve. Has he had smoking cessation counseling? If we don't get going on this, you'll have to anesthetize him for his amputation. Then we can do the amputation with regional blocks. Much better for the heart. It will not take too much time. I am very skilled with needles and ultrasound. Are you for real? Or are you just worried that this might interfere with your afternoon tea time? You've booked a case. I need to cancel it. You're making my head hurt. If you have a severe headache, I can do an occipital nerve block. If it persists, I'll add Botox. So, so I'm, I'm, glad you get the, I'm glad you get the humor. Uh, by the way, and, and Neil Sullivan uh, at the Children's Hospital uh, said I could give him credit for this. So, uh, uh, and uh, anyway, so I, I want you to think about these stereotypes, about whether this is a good thing to do or not. I mean, it's funny, and there's always some reality to it, but there are these stereotypes. And when you're looking at surgeons, some of the, and by the way, these that I'm, I'm going to mention here are things that I've just gotten over the years and more recently from surgeons and anesthesiologists I've talked to. So your stereotype, they never admit how much blood they've lost. They just want to make a lot of money doing the cases, more cases. They don't know anything about medical issues or they're always underestimating how long the case will be. And you're probably thinking, oh yeah, that's all true, right? And what they're thinking is they just want to get home early. They don't care about my patient. They're ready to cancel at the drop of a hat. They're often distracted, not paying attention, or they never tell us about the pressers they're using. And there's probably some reality between some people with all of those. And, and my point is, it's not that some of this isn't real, but I don't think these stereotypes are healthy. And I think I've just heard so much over the years about that dysfunctionality that it's just bothersome to me as a patient. Now, some of you, I think we're thinking, oh, yeah, I have great relationships with my, the surgeons I work with. This isn't an issue for me. And I think that's, I'm sure that that's true for, I know it's true for some people. And we can learn from those people, by the way. But from most of the people I talk to, it's not the case, and it's not universally the case. And there are these challenging, dysfunctional relationships that happen that, again, I think are an unmentionable that need to be mentioned. There's very little research about this, but Lorelei Lingard had done some of this work actually quite a long time ago, in the early part of this century. And one of the papers she wrote was about forming professional identities on the healthcare team, discursive constructions of the other in the operating room. And uh, what they did was they created scenarios, different kinds of simulated, not real live simulations, but uh, paper simulations, and asked people, actually they were videos, and they asked people to give their perceptions of what were, the, uh, what were the other people thinking on each one of the other professions involving surgeons, anesthesiologists, and nurses. And what they concluded was that the subject's constructions of the other profession's roles, values, and motivations were often dissonant with those professions' constructions of themselves. That the way you view surgeons are not the way they view themselves and vice versa and maybe reality somewhere in between. But this is the way people look at each other. And importantly, the team members use assumptions about the speaker's motivation to interpret communicative exchanges. So when you're saying something, or somebody's saying something to you, you're interpreting what they're saying partly through the stereotype. And if it's a negative stereotype, you are likely making wrong assumptions about what really needs to be done or what they're thinking. There's also the critical topic of conflict that Jonathan Katz published on, uh, in 2007, mentioning that sources of conflict are opportunities for collaboration. They probably aren't usually, but they, real, they aren't collaborations, but they are opportunities for collaboration. And mentioning that cancellation for additional evaluation is among the most frequent causes of conflict between surgeon and anesthesiologist. And I am sure for all of you that you know what this is about. But the question is, what, what is it, what's the effect that it has? Does it really affect patient safety? And there are real cases. So I've spent some time asking people about this and collecting real cases, not as a research project. Uh, but the surgeon who didn't, wouldn't listen to your advice, the colleague I have who I talked to, talked about when he was junior faculty, uh, 
was uh, administering anesthesia, was called in for an emergency. Their uh, presumptive diagnosis was sepsis. He said the physiology does not match this. Tried to tell them. They blew him off. They were wrong. He was right. Did not turn out well. And from surgeons, the anesthesiologists who they feel reject their advice. For instance, a surgeon who talked to me about uh, watching somebody struggle with a difficult airway and suggesting more than once that I, I think we really need to do a crike, and this is somebody who was expert in doing crikes, and it wasn't until really the last minute that they allowed him to do it, but it, it was a very close call. And from the surgeon's perspective, these are real things that happen that impact on patient safety because people don't listen to each other, don't trust each other. And then there's the good stories, the time that you were able to give advice and save the day. And actually, I talked to an anesthesiologist and surgeon about the same case they had of how the surgeons had uh, lost the needle uh, from a pop-off suture, and they were deep in the hole trying to get it and totally involved in it. And the anesthesiologist, who knew the surgeon well, was able at the right moment to say, hey, could you guys step back a second? and get them to think through this and get fluoroscopy and find the needle and other more serious cases as well uh, and ones that I've heard in QA but I'm not mentioning those where clearly the relationship was pivotal and things not going well because of the lack of a good relationship and the difficulty in speaking up and from the surgeon's side uh, from your side the times when the surgeon actually called you ahead of time and clued you in on some relevant anesthesia issues and I hear about those too. So there's two sides of this. When there are good relationships and things are working well, you know it's gonna make your day better when you walk in and it's a surgeon that you get along with. It's a big difference when it's somebody who you don't. And I think you can make a difference. I think there are things that people can do to improve those relationships, and I'm gonna suggest some. You probably have your own. These are just some that I've thought about. I don't have empirical evidence, except for over the years from my own personal experiences in trying to work on difficult relationships with people, that these general principles work, but this is not easy. It's not easy to do. I'm advocating for it and asking you to think about these and think, can you take a step? You know, one important thing is any kind of relationship conflict, often marital ones, you may be willing to say, yeah, I'm part of this. I understand my contribution, but it's 90% them. It's only 10% me, they're the problem. And if they're not gonna work on it, I can't do anything. I just not a good attitude. You, can't, you can change yourself, you can do things, and you can go halfway and you can take some first steps. And these are some of the ones I'd like to suggest. First, we need to study it. I'd like you to question your stereotypes. I'm gonna go through these in more detail. Inquire about the other side's point of view. Do some real team training. Work on solutions of mutual interest. Learn more yourself and be curious. So let me talk a little bit about all of those, and you can be thinking about which ones you might be able to use. First of all, there's almost no research on this. I think it's a really important issue. It's hardly ever been studied. How much of a problem, how, much do, how does each profession really view the other, not just from my anecdotes? What makes a good relationship? Why do the good relationships develop? And what approaches work to do what is right rather than arguing about who is right? You know, look at the bright spots of when relationships work well, and think about why they work well and see what you can do about that. Something you can do is invoke what we call the basic assumption. And we, this was developed at the Center for Medical Simulation, and I've ad adapted it a little bit, but that basic assumption is my colleagues are intelligent, hardworking, doing things in the best interest of the patient and trying to improve. Start out with that assumption. It's not always right. Some people are jerks, I get that. But if you start out thinking about, about people like this when something happens, it just really changes the way you go about having that communication. It's, again, it's hard work because you have evidence from people about why it's hard to hold that basic assumption because you have some, you've lost trust because of things they've done. It's hard to rebuild that trust, but you've got to actively think about how to do it. So seek the other side's point of view. I suggest take a surgeon to lunch. So if a new surgeon comes into the group, I know some groups do this, actually. They've told me about it. They invite the person to lunch. Have a dialogue. Get to know the person. Have a journal club. You could take my paper. People have told me they've done this. And get a couple surgeons together with a couple anesthesiologists and say, hey, what do you think about this? Why do we have these differing views? How do we get along? Because now there's something you can actually discuss. And you can learn some things. 
There's some really good books in general about this, like Difficult Conversations, which most of you have probably heard of, and a really wonderful book on thanks for the feedback. And you might think that's about uh, learning how to give feedback, but the most important thing in this book, and what I really took away from it, I've been still trying to work on, is if you learn how to receive feedback, it doesn't matter how the other person gives you feedback. Because even if it's negative feedback and done in a nasty way, you don't care because you're willing to hear things and you can decide whether it's worthwhile or not. So learning how to both give and receive feedback are important because if you give it well, then people who haven't read the book are more likely to hear it from you. I think simulation is a really powerful tool, as is team training, to get people to play together. So we're, again, fortunate with our captive insurance company, which thinks of itself also as a patient safety organization in some ways, and they give incentives. They started in 2001 with anesthesi for anesthesiologists, got an insurance premium incentive, as I mentioned, for doing uh, simulation-based training and CRM, added uh, OBGYNs and a labor and delivery full team training in around 2004, and about five years ago, the surgeons in high-risk malpractice categories get a substantial discount off of their premium, but they have to participate in a full team training with anesthesiologists and nurses every three years. And then there are some boosters, one of which is a team training without simulation. It's a 45 minute or a one hour booster, again, interdisciplinary, and they've been absolutely fantastic. And I've been a facilitator in those, sitting at a table with a senior surgeon, with anesthesiologists and nurses and scrub techs, playing a Lego game and watching that interaction uh, and it's really remarkable how it starts to change the dynamic when people play something relevant together. And I think it's important in the simulations to have them run long enough that you have to sit down and eat together. There's something about breaking bread together that I think gets over the barriers. When you know somebody and they, uh, you're just less likely to feel negatively. You're much more likely to think positively about them. Another thing you can do is work on mutual interest, solutions of mutual interest, like emergency manuals. If you don't have them yet, to really work to get them introduced, because the surgeons are important stakeholders in this. They need to be part of the whole process of developing your emergency manual and implementing it. There are many other things like this. We heard a wonderful talk at the meeting yesterday by David Bierenbach about infection management and the role that anesthesiologists play. I mean, you are a really critical part of whether that surgeon ends up, that surgeon's patient ends up with a post-operative infection. That's something you can work on together. And if you take that step of working on it and get to know those people, that in itself will improve that relationship. And then when you're thinking WTF, when you see somebody do something, what the F stands for is frame. It, it gets a really interesting technique to develop for yourselves. When you see somebody doing that, to stop and think, as, and I still, my wife's a psychotherapist, uh, so I'm really fortunate, so I can screw up in a lot of ways, and she's very forgiving. Uh, and, and I really worked on this for years, and if she does something, and I'm thinking, what, she, what are you doing that for? I've learned that it's immediately, it's, oh, that's interesting, what are you doing that for? It's a, just a totally different way to think about things. And it's remarkable, because most of the times you really learn a lot. Yes, sometimes what they're doing is really stupid, but most of the time, you just don't know their reason. It may still not be the best thing to do, but you're going to learn a lot about why they're doing it. So I think collectively, these kinds of actions that you can take can move the rock to improve the relationships, again, among the whole team. I'm suggesting this diet is something to focus on because two physicians who need to work together and collaborate together and who often have conflict, it's just not healthy for patients. So here's another version of, of that animation of maybe the world the way the world could be. Hi, I'm Carrie Knife from Orthopedia. Are you the registrar for anesthesia today? Yes, hi. I'm Andy Sleeper. I need to book a case to fix a femur fracture in a 74-year-old female. I told your perioperative team about her. Do you have an OR and anesthesia team available? We can make that happen. First, could we discuss her issues so we can figure out what's best for her? Sure. I just got a call about her. 
Thanks for the heads up. The cardiology note from three years ago said she has critical aortic stenosis with angina, but didn't want heart surgery. Last week she had three syncopal episodes, the last one causing her fall and fracture. How urgent is it to fix this fracture and are there reasonable non-operative alternatives whose risks may be lower for her? The fracture is stable and does not extend into her hip. We could delay until tomorrow, if further time would help for your anesthesia plan. Delaying would let us get a new TTE, though given her syncopal symptoms her valve is likely even tighter now, making her high risk for tanking on induction. We could ask cardiology if a pre-op valvuloplasty is an option. And, since she's DNR, let's find out her wishes in the event of a perioperative cardiac arrest. That's a real possibility. Is non-operative fracture management an option? Non-operative immobilization is definitely an option. The fracture will heal more slowly, but we can optimize for clot prevention, incentive spirometry, and physical therapy. Thanks for raising this issue. Could we talk to the patient and family together? Yes, thanks for your flexibility. So uh, I imagine some of you are thinking, boy, is he an idealist, uh, and that's naive. And some of you probably think, well, you actually have conversations like that with surgeons. I, again, I don't have empirical evidence to prove that any of the things I'm suggesting will actually work to make that your regular day every day. But if that's the kind of day you have every day with the surgeons you work with, it will bring not just more patient safety to perioperative care, but it'll bring more joy and meaning to your life in the operating room or wherever you work with surgeons. Again, I can't prove it. I think it's possible. I ask you to just pick one of these things and take a step or do it your own way. You have your own ideas. And if you have some that you want to feed back to me, I'm cooper at APSF.org. I'd be glad to hear them or whatever other feedback uh, you have to give. So I, I oh, by the way, I want to thank uh, Dr. Sarah goldhaber Fieber who, uh, who wrote this script. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And thank you all for all that you've done and will continue to do for anesthesia patient safety. And I hope you'll take the message to heart, spread it around. Let me know if anything good happens. I'd really like to hear about it because like safety, it's really hard to get good feedback about whether things made a difference. And I'd certainly appreciate it uh, one way or the other if you'd let me know. So again, thanks to all of you for listening and have a great day. So um, at uh, 2.45 and 15 minutes, don't leave the stage yet, Jeff, uh, in about 15 minutes, we'll be having the APSF workshop. It's on practical approaches to improving patient safety. A special thanks to Jeff. We have a certificate for him, and later this evening at a reception, he'll be receiving other award. So uh, uh, thank you all for coming, Jeff. That was terrific. Remember, on your way out the door, if you want to <laughs> Leave a little donation to APSF. There's a little thing you dip your thing in. We've got it out there. They'll uh, walk you through it, but it's in honor of Jeff Cooper. So Jeff, terrific, an incredible pioneer within anesthesiology. Thank you.